We doing good? Oh, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. Hang out. I'm glad you guys are doing well. It is always great to see all of you guys come out to Wednesday night. Well, we are starting a brand new series. Oh, before we do that, hope you guys went out and blessed somebody last week. We talked about that, closing out our book. Hopefully you left this place saying, you know what? I want to bless somebody, and he blessed somebody this week, last week. Good. We want to make sure we hear God's word, and then we go to do it. We are starting, starting a new book. It is the book of James, and the series title is called Apps for Life. And tonight, we're going to talk about Let Me Teach You. There is a purpose, I believe, that God has in everything, that he's able to work in any and every situation, even in situations where you look at it and say, God, there's no way you can fix this. God, things are just so far gone that, God, I don't know what you can do with this. But I'm here to tell you, not sure where you are in your walk with God, not sure what's going on in your life right now, but God can work in the most disastrous situations because God has this plan and this purpose for our lives. From time to time, we'll see uh, on the news that uh, Yellowstone could be on fire, that several hundred acres are, are burning down, and you're like, man, that's a huge fire, and it'll go on for sometimes days and, and weeks, and they're like, well, the fire is you know, almost 50% contained, and you look at that and you're thinking, man, the whole entire forest is, it's almost gone. But God, in his wisdom and in his grace and mercy, he's created things like this, this tree here. It's a pine tree, and you might notice that the cones here, that they're, they're closed, that they're not open. It doesn't open until... I think I read about 113 degrees Fahrenheit that this cone begins to open and then the seeds release. So it's not until a fire that these cones are able to open up and they release these little seedlings. So we're thinking that in this huge, huge flame here, it looks like it's all horrible, that it's all gone for naught, that everything is burned down. But then you look at this pine cone here, and the way God has created it, that as soon as it gets to a certain degree, that it opens up. Not only does it open up, but it opens up to release little seeds. That in the midst of this huge fire, in the midst of, of great devastation, God has created this tree in the midst of, of heat to not die but actually give birth to something. But it doesn't open up, it doesn't give birth to something until it's in the fire. Until it's so hot that the little resin, the little film that's keeping the seeds in place, it won't melt until it gets hot enough for it to release these seeds for new life to begin. I believe we're very much like this tree here, this pine cone. That God is have some, he has some great stuff locked up inside of all of us, but he has to send us through this fire. He's got to send us through this thing called life. But as he sends us through this thing called life, great things can happen. Now, it doesn't feel good, but just think, because of the fire, new life can begin. Because of the fire... God is birthing something new, something fresh. And just maybe God wants to do the same with you. He wants to birth something new in you. Thus, he has to send all of us through a little thing called a trial or life. I guess the question is, are we willing to allow God to teach us? Are we willing to, to follow God even when it's through a difficult time or difficult situation are we willing to say God just teach me what you need to teach me God because I am your student and I pray we're willing to say yes God teach me well let me give you a little introduction on the book of James James is the book of application it is called the the, the book of just simplicity that James is the kind of guy that is in your face he's going to tell us exactly what he's thinking about how he feels and then we're going to have to deal with it. 
James only has five chapters, but it is filled with some great, great applications that will help us to navigate this thing called our Christian walk with God. James is obviously the author, and he is the half-brother of Jesus. The book was written right around 45 AD, and he wrote it to a Jewish audience that were now Christians. They gave their lives to Jesus, so we would call them today completed Jews. So we're going to learn a lot about temptation, the tongue, trials, works, not sitting around. We're going to be challenged to grow. We will be convicted of our sins, of our thoughts. But James, he's just straight up in your face. But it's a good thing. He confronts us with a lot of things that we need to mature in Christ. So tonight, we are going to learn from James the key to facing life and trials. So if you haven't already turned to James, it's a small book in the back of your Bible. It's right after Hebrews. The book of James, we're only going to read a couple of verses tonight. Everybody there? And if you don't have your Bible, definitely bring one, or there should be one in front of your seat, or we can give you one after service, because we like to hear, want to hear some of that going on out there. James chapter 1, verse 1, it says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let us jump right into our study tonight. We're first going to find out that it's important to have the right attitude if Jesus is going to teach us. James is a wonderful example of having the right or a changed attitude. Most of you may not know, or some of you may not know, but James, since he's the half-brother of Jesus, he did not believe Jesus was the Messiah until after the resurrection. So you can imagine James growing up with Jesus. You would have to imagine his mom said, hey, by the way, this is, this is the Savior of the world. James probably said, come on, that's my brother. I know him. No way is he the Savior of the world. We, we, we live in the same house. We eat the same food. This guy is probably, there's something special about this guy. The Bible tells us that in John chapter 7, for even his brothers did not believe in him. So through the Gospels, Jesus' own brothers didn't believe that he was anything other than just this regular guy. So we have to ask ourselves, how did James go from having the wrong attitude to having the right attitude? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 15, it says, after the resurrection, or after that, that he, speaking of Jesus, was seen by James and by the other apostles. So not only did James have a bad attitude to begin with, but he had the right attitude because we, we read that he says, James, a, a bondservant. The word is a slave. So James goes from not believing to introducing himself as James, I'm a, a bond servant. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. That's so different from, from us. When we want to introduce ourselves, we're like, this is who I am, and this is the degrees I have, and this is all of my you know, things I've accomplished. We always want to kind of pump ourselves up. I've never introduced myself, hey, my name is Henry, a slave of Jesus Christ. I, I've never done that. But what I have done is sometimes, well, yeah, I've, I've been there. Yeah, I have a little experience in that. We have this, this tendency of, of building ourselves up. But James is letting the world know that I'm James, and I am a bondservant. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. He goes from not believing to saying, I'm totally yours. That, that my life is totally yours, Jesus. Isn't it wonderful to go from that, that state of unbelief to Jesus, uh, I'm yours? Because maybe some of you tonight or in the James camp before the resurrection where you're bumping shoulders with Jesus, you're coming to church, you're experiencing the presence of God, you're, you're hearing the word of God, but yet you're not a slave of Jesus Christ. You're just kind of hanging out with people. James went from having a wrong attitude to the right attitude that, that my life belongs to you. To be a slave, to have the attitude of 
I am not my own, that whatever you want me to do, Jesus, is exactly what I want to do. But it didn't happen in James's life until the Holy Spirit got a hold of James's heart and James saw Jesus after the resurrection. Not only that, but James uses a word for Lord called Kyrios. He uses a word that says that you're my God too. Bad attitude, I'm a bond servant, and you're also my God. I believe in you. And what a transformation that we read about here in James chapter 1, that God can do wonderful work. If you're here tonight and you've been in this little rut, don't lose hope that God can change you, that God can deliver you, that God can bring about wonderful change in your life. He did it for James, and he did it for scores of others. And as we're going to learn through the book of James, that God shows no partiality, that Jesus is for everybody, that he can deliver anyone and everyone, but it begins with who do we belong to. Well, the Bible goes on to say, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. James here was concerned about the spiritual warfare, welfare, I'm sorry, of his flock, of his readers. And the people in his church weren't all right there, so they were spread abroad. So it was during this time that the Jews were spread out all over the place. So James is writing to them. And it says, one of the commentators says, to the 12 tribes is a Jewish figure of speech that sometimes refers to Jewish people as a whole. So that is what James is addressing. So number one, we have the right attitude. Number two, we're going to learn about having the right perspective. Verse two, James says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Hmm. I have to openly confess something to you. Normally when I'm going through a trial, joy is not really the first thing that comes to my mind. Or the second. I'm somewhere over here when it comes to joy and trials. But James says, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Think about what you're going through right now. Is it there? Count it all joy. That's what he's saying. Count it all joy. All the, and it didn't say just one trial. It says various trials. He says, count it all joy. Maybe it's about having the right perspective. Perspective means a particular attitude towards or a way of regarding something, a certain point of view or an outlook on something. If you were to all stand up and sit up, stand up, no, no, don't do it though. If you were to all stand on the chairs you're sitting on and look around, your perspective would be different. If you were to come up here on the, the platform, your perspective would be different. God has this perfect perspective of our lives. He's able to see a different point of view than we can see. So we're down here freaking out. And God's up here going, okay, I see what's going to happen down here. Just hold on. Just hold on. Something is coming your way. You need to have a right perspective. If you had the perspective that I had, you would see that sometimes some of you are sleeping. Some of you are texting. Because it's all about perspective. So from God's point of view, everything is about having the right perspective. And once we have the right perspective, we can say, God, I must keep you in the forefront of my mind that you're shaping me and you're molding me so I can count all of these things as joy. I guess I would liken our lives very much to, to this wet clay that, God, I don't know why there's so much pressure going on right now, but in order to shape this into what the potter wants to shape it into, he or she has to uh, apply some pressure to certain areas. They've got to squeeze and pull in order to shape and mold this into what they want it to be. It's very much like our lives. God, I don't know why all this pressure is coming my way right now. I don't know what you're doing right now, but I do know God does all things well. I've never, that's, that's probably a good place for an amen. I've never seen God do something that was like, that's it? Really? All of this and we just got this? God does. We look at the things. Think of you before Christ. You got it in your mind? Look at you now. 
Is that not just crazy amazing that God can take our ugliness, our ashes, our just mud, and he can just take this out, put this in there, do this, stretch this, and move that out of the way. And he says, okay, here's our beginning. And you look back and say, man, look how I used to be, and look where I am now. Look what God has done. It's, it's the work of God's hand. So we know that when we go through these various trials, God is doing something. Paul even knew that. Paul says this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul is saying, okay, suffering right now and what's awaiting me. Hmm. Oh, man, this is nothing. Compared to eternity, this is nothing. Why? Because it's all about perspective. Family, things are going to get better. Amen. No matter what you're going through, you may be on your last little, little thread holding on. Things are going to get better. And one day we're going to look back and say, man, I was stressing out about that. Oh, that's nothing. Oh, if I compared what God has waiting for me with right now, Paul said it's not worthy to be compared to what awaits us. That means God is doing something great in our lives, and he's preparing us for something wonderful. So why should we have the right perspective? Verse 3 tells us, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. There's that P word. Uh-oh. So what does that mean? That means I need to grow. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Maybe tonight you're going through a fire. You're going through a real tough time and you just want out. Just open the locked doors because I am done. I want to get out. Well, just maybe God has you where you are because you need to grow. Maybe God has you exactly where you are because you are needing something. You are needing some growth. I am not a uh, gardener by any means, but I did read a little bit about roses. And I guess from time to time, you have to take some shearers to you. You've got to cut them off. And there's a certain way you've got to cut them. And when it's all done, it looks kind of ugly. But I understand that in order to help your rose bush, you've got to cut it back once in a while. Why do you want to do that? So it can grow and blossom. John 15, listen to this. It says, every branch in me, speaking of Jesus, that does not bear fruit, he, God, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Why? That it may bear more fruit. So you may be bumping along in your Christian walk and going, Hey, things are going great. Praise the Lord. You know, I haven't really done too, too bad. And things are going great, wonderful. And all of a sudden, poof, where'd that come from? I was doing so good. Lord, what happened? We were doing so great. What happened? Maybe God's pruning you. Maybe God has to cut a few things off. He's got to make you go this way, take a little bit of this away. Why? Because he wants you to bear more fruit. And that means we've got to go through a little bit of something. And most of us don't say, okay, God, here I am. Take me through all the pain you can that I might be better. That's normally not the prayer that we pray. But God says, oh, I need to prune you so you can grow. And when I'm done pruning you, you're going to be something beautiful. I might have to cut off a couple of things. I might have to remove a few things from you. This little season might be tough for you, but oh, how wonderful it is when that prune rose bush begins to bud again. It starts to grow just a little bit, then it starts to come out like that. And you see this, it's not even, it's not even a, a semblance of what it was before, a shadow of what it was before. Think of what your life is going to look like when God is done with you. It's going to be something glorious. I'm excited to see what God is going to do, something wonderful. But it says the testing of our faith it produces patience. Some of your Bibles may say perseverance or endurance. The word here means steadfastness, constancy, or endurance. So God wants to produce some endurance in you. He wants to produce some perseverance in you. I'm not sure if any of you ever like to walk or maybe even jog. Do you remember the first day you got out there? You're like, whoo, 
tired because you just started it. But then maybe a week later, you're like, hey, I can walk to the end of the block or I can walk around the park one time and then I can walk two times. And you know what? I can walk three times. What happened? Your endurance increased. It didn't feel very good. But once you got in shape, you said, you know what? Hey, walking around this park, that's nothing now. It began, it started off painful, but then you stretched and stretched and stretched. And what happened? Your endurance built up. I have a friend that I, he uh, rides bikes uh, avidly. And I said, hey, I need, I need to get out there because I need to get in shape. And uh, he's really, really good. And uh, he, three of us went out and um, they were really fast too. So they're up talking and having a great time. And I'm in the back just dying, just dying. <laughs> So my friend is all gracious and kind. He says, hey, so he dropped back. He said, how you doing? I'm like, I'm great. Lord, give me a flat tire. Do something to get me off this bike, please. And we went crazy amount of miles, and it was cold, and everything was hurting, and they're just laughing and having a good time, and I'm just dying. They were going fast. I was trying to keep up. I'm like, Lord, kill me now. It's just horrible. <laughs> but that really hurtful time? It increased my endurance. And our faith needs to have some endurance. Our faith needs to have some, some resolve. Our faith needs to have that type of, no matter how painful it is, God, I'm yours. No matter what you take from me, God, I'm yours. No matter what I have to go through, God, I am resolved to be your, your, your slave, your bondservant. Because sometimes, Things go wrong, and then the people in your row start to disappear. You might look down your row and say, what happened to so-and-so? Oh, they went through a little bit of something. That's where we need to say, my endurance that I've learned says I'm going to stay here. God, that I'm just going to trust you even through this difficult time. So knowing what the word patience means, let's, let's reread this. So knowing that the testing of your faith produces a steadfastness, a constancy, and an endurance. So God is doing something in you. He's stretching you, and he's growing you because he wants to produce something in you. To be steadfast means to be fixed in a direction, firm in purpose. Endurance means bearing pain, hardship, the ability or strength to continue or last, especially despite fatigue. Anyone ever had that little white flag raised in your face and said, God, I've just gone through too much. I'm done. My flag, I surrender. I'm done with this whole thing. Some of you maybe have been there. And maybe you're there tonight. God wants to build that endurance in you. That no matter what happens, that you are going to not only stay strong, but you are going to stay trusting in the Lord. Although it may not feel the greatest, it has some serious benefits. So what do we do? Verse 4, it says, but let patience have its perfect work. So thirdly, we have the right response. Let patience have its perfect work. What does that mean? Some of you may need to write this down. Let the process that builds your endurance and perseverance have its perfect way. Let the process in which God has you in right now, let it do what it needs to do. Those of you that love to cook, it's like Thanksgiving dinner. No matter how many times you go like this, it's not going to be done. There's a certain time frame that the turkey and the meal is going to be done. So if you continue to check it and check it and check it, it's not going to make it complete any faster. But if you allow the process to take place, the fire, the heat, when it's done, your turkey is going to look really, really good. Because raw turkey is not very good, I'm sure. So the process that God has us going through, let it have its perfect way. That means maybe we should stop praying, God, get me out of this. God, fix this. Maybe we should say, God, your will be done. Good night. But instead of that, we're always at God. God, fix, 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 fix. Heal, do, 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 rescue God. Come on, and we're quoting scripture, and we're doing all of these things. I wonder, God just says, give me, some, give me a little bit. I'm teaching you right now. Hold on. Take a deep breath. 
things are going to be okay. Stop rushing around. Nowhere in the scripture does it say, and Jesus ran to the next town. <laughs> right? It doesn't say that, does it? When Lazarus died, what happened? He's like, okay. Stayed there, what, three, four days. Nowhere in the Bible do you hear Jesus was in a rush. Nowhere. I mean, literally nowhere. So why is it we're always saying, God, hurry up. God, hurry up and fix. Hurry up and do. And we tack it on with Jesus saying, and we're giving all these things up, and God says, no, you need to be right where you are. And hopefully that's resonating for some of you. You need to be exactly where you are tonight. May not feel the greatest, but where you are tonight is where God wants to teach you. And what happens sometimes is, is if we don't learn our lesson at this juncture in life, we're failed to repeat it at this juncture in life, this juncture in life, and again and again. It's like this circle. I'm the kind of guy, just give it to me all at one time. I don't like the little here's and there. Just do it all. Give me everything right now so I can just take it right now. But sometimes we want to jump out of God's furnace, missing the lesson. And then we wonder why things aren't always going so well. We, we wonder why we don't have that right response. We have to ask ourselves, how do you respond to your trials? What's your response? God, why am I going through this? How do you respond to the things that are going on in your life right now? How's it going? You complaining, you praying, you wanting to get out of it? Or are you willing to say, God, I want you to, to have your way? Let patience have its perfect work. Because it's during this time, during the difficult times in life, where our Faith truly reveals. David Guzik says, trials do not produce faith. They seem to reveal the faith we have or don't have. So true, huh? Several years ago, I used to work for uh, United Couriers, and I got into a, uh, at a car accident, and I hit this guy, and he, his car was maybe 200 bucks. I mean, it was a horrible car. And uh, he's like, hey, are you going to get in trouble? Uh, if your boss finds out about it, I'm like, uh, yes, I am. He says, you know what? How about we meet later on tonight and you just pay me a little something? And I'm like, you know what? That sounds like a great idea. So I called my wife and I said, hey, I just had a little fender bender, but no worries. This guy said I can just give him a couple hundred bucks, and it's like it's all good, free, and clear. My wife is a spiritual one. She said, would Jesus be in some back alley doing some deal? I'm like, oh, you've got to bring Jesus into this. Oh, my goodness. Can we have a conversation without bringing him into this, please? I won't be in trouble. Just a couple hundred bucks in his little bucket of a car will be fine. He says, Jesus wouldn't do that. <laughs> Went back to my job. I got in an accident. Here's all the information. Man, I didn't trust. I didn't trust that God could work stuff out. That's, sometimes we're like that, where we want to take the shortcut out of stuff. Well, if I can just do a little bit of this, then this will be all right, right? Nothing's really wrong with it. Then we wrap our mind around it. We're like, yeah, I think that's okay. That's being wise. That's what that is. No, that's trying to get out of the lesson that God wants to teach us. Well, verse 4 goes on to say that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Well, this is the key. That God wants us to be complete. Not complete in the sense that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that you are lacking something, but complete as in your toolbox is missing a couple of tools, and God wants to give them to you. Because sometimes we go through a, a trial where we go through our toolbox. How can I get out of this? I can do this. I need this. I need this. God says, nope, you're missing something in your toolbox. You're missing something that you need. I guess the question is, is there a certain area in your life where you would like to grow more in? If you were to look right now, what area of your life would you say, Lord, I need a little bit more growth here in this area? You get a little bit of a picture of that? What area, God, can I, I'm kind of weak in this area, Lord. I, I want to grow in this area. I think God honors those prayers. God, help me to grow in the areas in which I'm lacking. But you know what that means. Some of you have a problem with forgiveness. Some of you have a problem with love. Some of you have a problem with gossip. 
Some of you are just mean sometimes. God will challenge you in those areas so you can do better. Have you noticed that in your life? You seem to keep repeating the same stuff over and over again. You keep dealing with the same things over and over again. Just maybe God says, you need help in this area. So let's all learn the whole forgiveness thing now because that thing is painful to learn. So just forgive. I forgive you. Because if not, things will keep on happening. You're like, God, oh, my heart. You need to learn to forgive. Because if you don't learn to forgive, God is relentless in the sense he won't leave you in the same way he found you. So he'll give another opportunity for you to learn forgiveness. If you don't learn here, he's going to do it here. You're like, why, God, why? Everyone is so mean to me. They're a horrible God. God says, yeah, but you don't forgive. We're not talking about me right now, God. We're talking about everybody else, God. He's worried about you. He's worried about your heart. He's worried about your tool chest. This is how God teaches us to grow, how we become stronger, and it's through trusting God. Living life, we have these wonderful opportunities to grow and to learn. First Peter tells us, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have what? Suffered a while. What is he going to do? Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. All that sounded good until he got to suffering, right? After you had suffered a little while, he's going to perfect and establish and strengthen. He's going to make you strong. That's what God wants to do in every one of us. He wants to make us strong believers in him. But it got to, it got to, it has to go through suffering. It's a process that's going to transform us into exactly what God wants us to be. What I love about God is that when we are lacking something, he is not going to let us continue to go without addressing that problem. In the Bible, there was a rich young ruler found in Matthew chapter 19. So he was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. So you could say in his tool chest, he had everything. Well, almost everything. So he comes to Jesus and he says, how might I inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him a couple of things. Then Jesus goes on to say, well, if you want to be perfect, rich young ruler, perfect again, that's that word, go sell what you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Good deal to me. You're with Jesus for the whole time. Wonderful, right? Not so for this guy. He says, it says, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. You see, his possessions were possessing him he looked in his tool chest and saw oh i'm rich i'm a ruler i'm young things are going good but there's something missing let me go to this jesus guy jesus says this is exactly what you're missing and he was unwilling to give everything away because of his great possessions i wonder what you might be missing tonight if jesus were to say if you want to be perfect, this is what I want you to do. If you want to be perfect, this is what I want you to do. If you want to be perfect, this is what I need you to do. I wonder if we would hang on his every word. Okay, what is he going to say? Something easy, please. Something easy. Something easy, please, please. Jesus goes for whatever has our heart. He goes for that thing that has us locked up. He goes for that thing that we tend to think about a lot. He goes for that thing and he says, no. You need to give up that. You need to not let those possessions possess you. He gave him the invitation of a lifetime. He says, give away everything and come follow me. And the man went away sorrowful. There's a story. It says a shipwrecked man, he managed to reach an uninhabited island. There to protect himself against the elements and to safeguard a few possessions he had salvaged, he painstakingly built a little hut from which he constantly and carefully scanned the horizon for the approach of a ship. Returning one evening after a search for food, he was terrified to find the hut completely enveloped by flames. Yet by divine mercy, this hard affliction was changed into a mighty advantage. 
Early in the morning, he awoke to find a ship anchored off the island. When the captain stepped ashore, he explained, quote, We saw your smoke signal and came. Everything the maroon man owned had to be destroyed before he could be saved. Everything. He wasn't about to light a fire to those things. But it wasn't until everything that kept him was destroyed that he actually was saved. Jim Elliott tells us, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. All of our possessions, family and friends, will go by the wayside. We will lose those things. But the thing that we will never lose is Jesus and eternal life. Amen? Let me give you a couple of things to take home with you. The first one is, trust God enough to know that he knows. He knows everything about us. He knows what we're going through. Trust that he knows everything and he is mindful about what you're going through because he has the greatest vantage point in the house. Believe that he's all-powerful and that he loves you enough to let you go through certain things in order that you might become something other than what you are right now. That's called love. We can't accomplish this on our own. It is a work of God. But the part we do play in it is we need to say, God, I am your bond servant. Do in me what you will, that we would not fight the trial, but that we would be willing to let God have his perfect way in our lives. Then secondly, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what's going to happen. Don't be afraid for tomorrow. Stop fearing and fretting. God is all-powerful, and when it's time for you to go, you're going to go. You're not, there's not going to be any arguments about it. So why don't we trust God that while he has us here, that we don't have to be afraid of things. We don't have to go around fearing, fearing jobs and money and these issues and these problems and all of these things. I think we're going to look back, family, and we're going to have some regrets because we spend so much time fearing and being afraid of all of these things. How are we going to make it through? We just need to wash our hands and say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but it's all yours. I can't fix it, God. Do something. Instead of that, we're like, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to turn out. Man, I'm not sure if we're going to make it this month. Really? But we've all been there, right? Been there? Honey, the milk is getting low. I don't know. I don't have too much gas in the car. The light is on, and we all know how far you can go when the light is on, right? Because we've all been there. I'm going to drive slow. I know exactly how far I can get. But we can trust God, can't we? We can trust God believing that he's going to get us through as he has even those difficult times. God is going to get us through whatever we're going through right now. But are you counting it all joy? Are you counting what you're going through right now joy? Or are you fighting it? James says, count it all joy because God is producing something great in you. Remember this little guy? May that be us, giving birth to something great. Might be a little charred, might be a little burned, but we know it's going to produce something. So we can count Whatever we're going through, joy, because God planned, planned something special for this little guy. He's planning something even greater than you, because you're more than that, right? God didn't die for that, right? He died for, for this. So if he can plan for some fire to release some seed, I think he can plan to do some pretty miraculous things in all of you and in me if we would simply allow him to do it, amen.